You're listening to your number one radio station. This is the Cannabis Community Project. Oh, oh yeah. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. And now, broadcasting live from the Dink Studios at 3835 Elm Street in Denver, Colorado. It's the Grind and Burn, a podcast from the Cannabis Community Project. Hey, Cannapreneurs. Let me take a second just to tell you about Cushly Organic Products. What it does is it eliminates odor. It doesn't mask it. It's not a perfume. It's not a cologne. It eliminates it. And it's organic and it's non-toxic. www.cushley.com. Also find them on Facebook and other social media under the same name. Cushley Organic Products. Look for it soon on the CCP store. (laughs) Indeed, you'll love it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, You know, if it can be pumped out at... 50, 75 cents a piece. Oh, yeah. They're almost giveaway items. And, but and tchotchkes are bought in the millions. And even though you're only getting a penny or two every time, that's millions of pennies, and that builds right? up fast. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Bush. I'm the president of the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to the the very first fundraising activity that the uh, IHRF has uh, put on. Uh, We're at the Greenhouse in Denver, and we have uh, a lot of interesting things going on today. We have several speakers on uh, the general topic of industrial hemp on the cutting edge in Colorado. So we have people talking about some of the newest developments and most recent happenings in the industrial hemp industry. We have some demonstrations going on for hemp fiber, hemp building materials. We have some uh, people who are in the industry uh, selling consumer products. They're here today to sell some of their products and show them off. And we also have a very interesting silent auction that features a lot of hemp-related products as well as some other things. While they're at it, we also have uh, some good refreshments and... And I think we're just going to have a very good time networking with one another and learning more about the hemp industry. I really okay. appreciate you taking the time yeah. to talk to me, too. You know, I feel lucky to even be here, you know. My name is Thomas Ivory, Jr., and I'm with the Denver Hemp Division. And I've been growing industrial hemp for the past two years. This is my third year, and I've been involved in the community since 2013. And it's great to see the people who are still here. It's really about community, you know. So that's what uh, the Denver Hemp Division is, is all about, is to connect the community, to educate, and to provide transparent knowledge. So we can all move forward in the right direction. I've made a couple of blunders and uh, have messed up a couple of times uh, through growing, you know, genetics, like planting errors and stuff. And my goal is to make those mistakes so then other people don't have to. There's so many people out here with so much awesome information. And so it's good to reach out and talk to them. But at the same time, you need to experience it for yourself to truly gain that understanding. Cool, man. Did you want to promote anything specific or just kind of the organization in general? Well, I did bring in a hemp beer in here. So here you go, sir. Do oh, you okay. drink? I do. Nice. Well, this is a homebrew. My dad's been a uh, homebrewing my whole life. And I finally reached a point where I was like, Dad, you know, I'm tired of just watching or washing the bottles. Teach me how you actually make the beer. So he started showing me the recipe. And what my life has basically become is like I do all these different things. I make kombucha, I make beer, beauty products. And what life has become now is just add hemp to that. I was already doing these things and now I'm just adding hemp to it. And it's made my products even better. What's so, the uh, alcohol content? That's about like 5%, oh, maybe okay. 5.3. So decent beer. So, 
yeah, yeah, it's a light beer. It's a pale ale. Um, so I, my intent is drinkability. So then, and also adding the aroma and the flavors to yeah, it. Yeah, you're not going to be disgusted. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to have like six or 12 of them if you need to, okay. you know. Some of those other home brews are so thick and heavy, you know, and too hoppy. Mine, I'm really kind of working on like the flavor of the hemp. I'm, I'm still like in a lot of the research and development as a lot of us are. And I have a lot of different products out there. So I'm always refining my recipe. So I'd love to hear your feedback. Excellent. Give your website or social media or wherever you want somebody to check out what you're doing. That'll be uh, denverhempdivision.com. And uh, you can find me on Facebook or just go to my website. That's where I'll uh, post up a lot of my events that I'll be doing as, as well as promotions too. Under the same name? Yeah, Denver Hemp Division. On Facebook also. Yep. Very cool. Well, this is a cool thing that you're doing. So thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate it. Thank Cheers. You, man. How long have you been listening to the show? Long enough to know that it's your show, and all you got to do to be on it is just reach out to us at CannabisCommunityProject.com or email brainstorm at CannabisCommunityProject.com. The storm is coming, Frank says. The storm that will swallow the children. I'll deliver them from the kingdom of pain. I'll deliver the children back to their doorsteps. I'll send the monsters back to the underground. I'll send them back to a place where no one else can see them. On a side note, for those of you who do not want to fully indulge in the outdoor activities of the 420 weekend and all the hoopla that's going on, and you're just the type of folk that like to stay home, maybe watch a movie or two, puff on your bud, hit your rig, relax. Well, let me recommend the movie Big Eyes. I'm on the Netflix plan, the one where they send you a movie, you watch it, send it back, then they send you another one on your Netflix queue. And the one that came in the mail yesterday was Big Eyes. I just wanted to recommend recommend it to all of you in the community as something to watch while you're medicating or participating recreationally. It's a fun movie. It's a fascinating movie. It kept me enthralled, but it also made me think of something else. And watching this movie, Big Eyes, reminded me of myself as a kid being called Big Eyes. And then that reminded me of a conversation I had with Hetty Becca from Hetty Healthy Lifestyle. Becca and I were talking, I don't know, some months back. And during our conversation, we had a little offshoot side topic that came up and actually cut it out of the show because it was irrelevant. It had nothing to do with what we were talking about. But I save everything I cut out because it triggers memories and other things that come up. And when I was watching this movie, Big Eyes, it reminded me of my childhood and Big Eyes, which reminded me of a conversation I had just a couple months ago with Becca. And then I found the connection to the show. So I just want to give you a couple minutes right now just to listen to the fun little back and forth Becca and I had and how much fun you could have while medicating, watching movies, and having fun conversation with people too. That's all it is. That's what it's all about here at the Cannabis Community Project. like a little kid <laughs> well i don't know i don't know much about speech therapy in that sense but there might be a few theories on yeah people's voices and how they change and how how your tone of voice reflects certain things about you and oh yeah maybe things that in the past and everything else i don't know now when i was young people used to say i sounded like a young girl too when i was really young oh yeah mm-hmm. and then i went through these years of me trying to intentionally <laughs> right now, I, speak low <laughs> and clear when i was a kid i remember people said oh what big eyes you have so i went through this phase of walking around like half stone look right be like i'm not having big eyes <laughs> like, you know what my son my littlest one maxwell he has the biggest eyes and just so cute and everybody comments on that but i wonder yeah, if he's, gonna, he's become... gonna walk around like jim brewer like a, <laughs> right yeah, i can yeah. remember people saying oh what a baby face you have so mm-hmm. for years as a kid i would like stand out in the cold and be like i'm gonna rough my face up i don't want a baby <laughs> face i want to be a man <laughs> but now i'm like oh well maybe it's my man it <laughs> is like i say the same thing i always was told I had a baby face, round, chubby cheeks. <laughs> and now that I'm 41, I actually have some definition in my face. And, yeah. you know, I'm like, ever says you don't even look anywhere near 41. People are like, I see you late 20s, early 30s. I'm like, that's 10 years. 
Well, you know, attitude has a lot to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you've met people who are quite young, but appear to be kind of old. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is kind of attitude, how you carry yourself, how you present yourself. Also health. Yeah. I think your health has a lot to do with it. Or if you're kind of an unhealthy person, Mm -hmm. um, you can appear to be a little bit older looking. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've noticed that just since... Do you smoke cigarettes? I used to, yeah. You used to, but how long has it been since you had Oh, well, I have always I was always a social smoker. Uh-huh. And then I started going through my 40 change, and my husband always smoked. So I started smoking when I turned 40. So no, about a year ago. Oh. So I'd smoke with him because I, I took like a month off of work, evaluate what I was doing with my life. So I just smoked with him. When I was home alone, I'm like, well, I'll just smoke. And so I just started smoking. I've given I'm it doing up three the, times in my life. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Do, I'm doing an electronic. I'm doing the Julu. From the packs. We have vapor cigarette. It's just the e-cigarette type yeah. thing. Okay. But it's 10 times better than that. For me, I, yeah. and I do need to get off of that. I, my husband's asked me to stop doing that by the end yeah, of the year. It's been almost five years since since I've last smoked. And, I, and it was a few years before that. And then I gave it up. And now, like, done. Now, just the thought of it. I, mm-hmm. I've i tried to smoke cigarettes. No, I couldn't even I do a cigarette. I can't get through more than, like, two drags. Yeah. It's, just, it's the smoke. I couldn't do it for the smoke, just sheer alone. And my husband quit smoking, of course. So I picked it up and he quit. So he's been quit a year now. <laughs> I'm like, going. thanks. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll, me- they'll mess your skin up and everything. Smoking yeah. cigarettes will make you look well, old. And, yeah. yeah, I do agree with that. So that's my last little, I shouldn't say my last, but I do need to. Well, there you go. Thank you to Hetty Becca for all your time and conversation and participating with us right here on CCP Radio. Well, there you go. Check. I love cannabis. Check, check. Oh my God, I'm peeking. I'm running with some of the endless flows of pro at bringing the ruckus. We kill them all, bro. The fall, keeping the shit above it. I buzz like a bumble, drop jaws whenever I rumble. You said you write rhymes, but it sound like you got carpal tunnel. Or all fright I might just on night this, this priceless. So how you gonna change overnight, kid? My style all wow, Chappelle, you floor now. Show a bound to sink in my waters until you all drown. Revealing you all now, fake cats get put to sleep. The young vet, we hold the minds that you for seek. I pump through from Long Beach, I call it treason. My n- to take your soul, kick it for no reason. You fools do do better off being neutral. Cause I go cuckoo. They see Rio and then I look you. Sex and bitch, they call my sutures. I make them useful. Shorty try to lock me down, but that's the shit I'm used to. This shit is crucial. Go Facebook, I prison mooch you. I won't remove you. I'll just let the karma suit you. This what the brew do. Uh. 40 hours of poop in the showers. You know, towers soften in towers. The world is ours. Hours. Don't want it, uh. Ill minded, that's the Hans. Let me get him. Uh, uh, you thought it was. Uh, yo, <laughs> check the verbal attack. It's early in the rap to leave you in a surgical strap. They get your verse, this burst with a thirsty raps. All killer scrap with a thriller latch. You got a sick beat? My heart beats sicker, call it an illa batch. They think the riz is back, or the jizz is back, or the jig is back. Nah, sorry to disappoint. It's just this new killing track right. with no complications from this skill contemplating. Leave you contemplating from the combinations of your compilations. And I never fathom, just get at them with every last atom. Subtract an atom to the battle list that can't scrap with some animals. Uh, Stay with that antidote for those that always have them see fear. For you know the regular beast coast, but the coast gonna never be clear. Ooh. He'll always kill the style because it don't get better by each year. Each other minute I'm missing life just becomes a leap year. Uh, Cause afterlife is no, we coming after life. N- couldn't see him afterlife with half the mics, he killing afterlife. Could you pass right. the mic for the train of thoughts of assassinites? A shot at every verse with the ill mind that is one you have to. Uh, uh, what y'all really want? Uh, 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 what y'all really want? Uh, Whenever you're ready, just start out with, hi, I am, and this is who I am. All right. We'll go from there. Okay. Hi, 
I am Jeremy Krause. I am the new grow manager here at Dank. I've been working here for about a year and three quarters, about two years now, and uh, have uh, just recently become the grow manager back around Christmas time. Uh, 2015, correct? 2015. So My you... official titles kicked in on New Year's. Christmas Eve, they gave me the news, which was a nice little Christmas gift for me. And then once 2016 rolled around, anything that came down cloned and propagated and then grown after that was all on me, uh, 2016 going forward. What were you doing before? <laughs> Truthfully, I was doing the exact same thing. Um, <laughs> but what had happened was... Was we did not have a grow manager and we needed one really bad. Uh, the guys uh, were basically, we didn't have a leadership role. I kind of took over that spot. I had worked in corporate jobs in the past where I knew the tier of what a manager means to a team and not having that was noticeable. The, the leadership. The leadership and uh, the direction, the vision needs to be one guy's. Otherwise, you got seven guys thinking different things. So. Right. And, and I assume everybody in a grow room is a previous grower, whether privately in their home or some other type of experience. Yeah. So they're all chefs, quote unquote, mm -hmm. come into the yeah. grow room, yep. probably with their unique styles of right. growing and their own opinions of growing. So somebody has to take charge, yeah. right? Somebody has to stand up and say, we're all growers, mm -hmm. but we're going to choose this direction yeah. and here's where we're going. I'll tell you one of the favorite uh, quotes that I've heard about growing and growers is for however many growers there are in the world is how many different ways you can grow. Right. And so everybody's got a different way. And what's unique here at Dank is we have a lot of guys that actually weren't growers. Some of them were trimmers and some of them were had never worked in the industry whatsoever. And some of them started out as our pre-way guys that were packaging our weed. Uh, our cannabis was getting packaged and then they moved up one way or another. Pre-way? Pre-way. We call it pre-way because it's just we weigh up the material <laughs> previous of the sale. It, it just sounds like saying like peewee, like peewee baseball or something yeah. like your, your JV, you know, you're yeah. working your way up to the... And, and, <laughs> and it kind of is. Um, there's nothing, no disrespect there. You yeah. got to start somewhere. And some guys were looking for a job and they applied here and they got the job and started at pre-way and then they worked their way up through good work ethic. So pre-way is the equivalent to the mailroom and a corporation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I don't want to take anything away from that right. position. Well, there's nothing uh, wrong with working in the mailroom if that's where you're starting yeah. out. I mean, right. everybody starts somewhere. I, I used to work at uh, Wells Fargo Bank in the processing center, which is oh, yeah. literally taking boxes and boxes of checks and, typing and up. not even doing that, but just just sorting them, uh -huh. right? I, I wish I had something physical to do, like type or something. Right. You're literally just going through checks, making sure numbers are there, yep. and then running them through machines, yep. which is very monotonous work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> inevitably, that's what it is here. You're yeah. taking big uh, one-pound bags of cannabis and then breaking them down into joints, grams, eighths, quarters. Who's doing the grinding on that? There's got to be a we, yeah, we got a tunnel. Yeah, we, uh, uh, I, I don't want to give away any secrets away here, but we use a, a like a... Yeah, uh, pretty uh, much like a or works up. This is uh, for a person. Obviously, it wouldn't work yeah. in a commercial standpoint if you're grinding through pounds and pounds of stuff. Yeah, but uh, if you're doing, you know, an eighth at a time or something, right. definitely more comfortable and ergonomic than a small, twisty, round uh, palm yeah. type thing. This is just a very ergonomic, and it has yeah. blades, so it's a slicer yeah. rather than pushing through little holes. And that's gorgeous. Are really trying to grind. That, that, that is nice. Yeah, yeah, best grinder I've ever used yeah. in my life um, because it wasn't really built for grinding weeds. So. Right. I think people put some thought into grinding herbs, uh -huh. whereas, you know. Weed might just be marketed as, <laughs> yeah, I get you. Well, par I'm, I'm always, uh, I like paraphernalia. I'm, mm -hmm. a, I like, I'm a paraphernalia type person. Yeah. I like cruising the lighters and the gadgets and the deals. I got my, yeah, I got my vase pen, my vaporizer, <laughs> my silver surfer, my bong, my chambered bong, you know. Yeah, and all the little things that come but with I, it. I grab my one hitter the, the most, you know. The one hitter, is yeah. that, that's where you typically go I with. use just the, the, one, the straight pipe glass one hitter and. And I think I pack like, you know, two to three hits at a time because I, I'm a little spoiled here where I can <laughs> just tap out after the first couple of hits, get those green hits and then right. tap out. So Well, you're, you're working, so it's a little more difficult to just smoke throughout the day when you're yeah. actually working. Um, in the past, in other jobs, I had no problem smoking. But ever since I became a manager here, I realized that it's just a lot easier not to be, you know, partaking. It's not a great role model. You, you can say yeah. it. We don't have to be ashamed yeah. that sometimes being so Sober is yeah. a better state to yeah. be under certain conditions. Yeah. Yeah. We don't always have to be stoned, yeah. <laughs> per se. One thing I know for <laughs> sure is there's a, a couple guys, a, a couple of the individuals that I know 
when I come back from break that are avoiding me as a manager. And I, and I know why I wasn't always a manager. So yeah. you come back from break and you see your manager and you turn around and go walk the other way. <laughs> I have a feeling I know why that is. Well, so. I'll, I'll have to introduce him to my cushly spray. So there you go. That's, <laughs> he eliminates. Well, all yeah, stuff. sometimes their eyes and <laughs> behavior gives it away before. But what is the official policy when working in a regulated grow room as far as consumption goes? Nothing. We have uh, absolutely nothing on site, nothing on the premises. For what it's worth, I don't know what's going on. From a policy standpoint? Policy standpoint, it's illegal. Okay. Absolutely illegal. Um, in fact, it's heavily enforced. Uh, I worked at a place that got shut down for people using on-premise. On breaks and, on, and stuff outside. Um, and, yeah, yeah, in a break room. Yeah. They had a oh, vape a pen. Break. Inside. Or a, uh, a dab rig. Uh, and uh, the MED caught them on camera. You know, we were doing about 35 pounds a week. Uh, and they got shut down for a year and a half for it. So you can imagine millions and millions of yeah, dollars for of some guy, you know, who's smoking in, in the break room doing a dab. So uh, here at Dank, we're, he- you know, we what we call a, a, a culture of compliancy. And each individual here, whether it's a manager or our preway people, know that uh, compliancy to the law is more important than you getting stoned. You know, we make sure everybody knows that. We have a parking lot that's way off site. And like I said, I don't want to know what's going on out there, but uh, I wasn't always a manager. So, yeah. yeah. As I like to tell people, we made marijuana legal. We didn't make stupidity legal. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Right. So uh, don't take both of those hand in hand. Yeah. Just because marijuana is legal doesn't mean stupidity is. But to, as a emerging leader in a grow room, in a dispensary, you must still deal with young kids, space cadets, uh-huh. stoners, yeah. uh, maybe people who are a little less employable in the world exactly. than, than mm-hmm. the uh, average person. But you still got to make business done. So is there a vetting process? Do you have to just take what you're dealt because yeah. the market needs people at this point? Well, I'll tell you this. When it comes to vetting, I come from Iowa. I was a hard worker all my life. I've worked horrible, nasty jobs. And I've learned what a good worker is and what the meaning between a hard worker and a good worker and trying to find the balance of the two. Because sometimes your best worker is not always your hardest worker uh-huh. and vice versa. We've got examples of both cases. And I'm always trying to find the happy medium between the two right. of a hard worker and a good worker because it's important to be both. Well, and what would define a good worker, but not working hard? You show up on time, you're polite, you're friendly, you do everything told. Uh, maybe it's not the fastest pace, maybe it's not the most accurate way, but you're doing everything that's being told. You're showing up on time. You're fulfilling all the responsibilities that I had asked from somebody. If you know, We have a chalkboard with all our jobs. So minimal to get yeah, by. Yeah, and, and not even minimal as much as it's, uh, I guess that's more of a, you just know it when you see it, or it would be somebody. Pornography. That's I didn't, I didn't want to go. <laughs> I, I didn't want to take that. Yes, route. I do yes. recognize it yes. when I see it. Yes. <laughs> so on the other flip side, there we have really hard workers that work their butts off and kick butt when they are showing up. Or, you know, maybe they don't show up, no show, no call. They uh, come in hungover. Those type of guys that you're like, oh, man, it's, it's going to be one of his bad days. But then <laughs> they kick butt. And you're like, okay. So there, consistency maybe would be a good word right. for a good worker. Which is always the toss-up, right? Yeah. You're never going to have the perfect right. of everything. Right. So it's always mm-hmm. either talent versus Yeah, and grit, talent, right? talent falls in there too and, uh, and work ethic. So And then when you talked about vetting and – in this industry, we get a pile of applications weekly. And if I wanted to, I could fire people weekly and hire people weekly. And that's just not what I want to do. What I'd like to do is build good, hard workers. And ideally, as a manager with the individuals that I have on our grow crew right now, improvements can be made all to everybody, including myself. So yeah. what I try to do is see what things the strengths that guys have and use those strengths as examples for others to build on and then weaknesses as well. That's some great leadership. Let's back up and find out where this comes from. Are you a university educated in business? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I went to school. Was that a no? Uh No, well, you said (laughs) when I heard university, no. um, I went to a technical college in in Madison, Wisconsin. I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, you're kidding me. 
Yeah. Nice. Uh, I lived on State Street for six years. I lived there for a few years and then yeah. we moved when I was a little kid. But. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So State Street's like yeah. the party street and the okay. college. So I lived on campus. Most of my friends will all went to UW. So right. I went to school to be a firefighter. And I can um, see that. You kind of got that, uh, that Iowa yeah. look. Yeah. 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 Iowa or Ohio? Iowa. Iowa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Iowa, went to, you know, in Iowa. High school football. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay. You got me. You, you dialed it in all. <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, and I wanted to be a military guy and I thought about all that stuff. And I have epilepsy, which leads me to you know, where I'm at now. I had epilepsy, went to school to be a firefighter, hadn't had a seizure in a long time, ended up having a seizure in the fire academy itself. I uh, was going through the hiring process, had a seizure. For the first time? No, no. You def- knew about this since childhood. Right, but I hadn't had a seizure in five years. You know, this is, we're talking t- 1997. Why since five years? Um, what happened? It just spontaneously Yeah, stopped? they had thought that I, when I was a kid that it was a juvenile thing, you know, puberty and hormones and they thought maybe it was just strictly mm. I'd grow out of it. Uh, out of seizures? Well, yeah, yeah. Because they called it junior myclotic epilepsy, which is I wasn't having grand mal seizures that you see on TV and stuff or what you think of a seizure. Uh-huh. I had like a stutter or I would roll my eyes, I, just little seizures. And what ended up happening was I had a grand mal seizure while driving and hit a car and had to get pulled out of my car by firefighters. Oh, shit. Yeah, I had the firefighters, you know, drag me out of the car. They saw my firefighting gear in the car and they freaked out. You know, they saw, they're like, I remember them saying, he's a firefighter. And they treated me like I was family at that point, you know, and they were physically, and you could see it on their faces, like, get this, let's take care of this guy. Hmm. And it was at that moment that I realized I couldn't be a firefighter. It wasn't because of rules. You can be a firefighter with epilepsy. The problem is the type of firefighter I wanted to be, I was not going to be able to do. You know, I couldn't jump through buildings and drag kids out because if I had a seizure, there'd be two firefighters coming in after me, plus the kid on my shoulder. You know, it would have just been a bad deal. And it would have been really selfish for me to continue that dream. And I pretty much had to give it up. And I became a bartender. You know, which is probably the story for a lot so of people. So you turn the alcohol. Uh-huh, yeah. And um, the firefighting gig, I finished the, the degree and stuff just, to, you know, because I had been going to school for it. You know, I, at that point, uh, had to change directions and didn't had no idea what I was going to do. Bounced around the country a little bit doing sales, mostly sales jobs, route jobs. I'm a, like a delivery guy and any sort of sales. I can sell ice to an Eskimo. So <laughs> it, um, I got that ability in me to talk. I became a salesman. And once I was a salesman, when they made me like a, a route guy where you're driving these big trucks. Well, um, the seizures came back, had another seizure. On the job. No, but what had happened is I went to the doctor. They said, you, you know, you can't be a driver anymore. I lost my job. Like wow. in the doctor's office, they took my CDL away. Do you get disability when that happens? You don't. Um, Social Security Department looks at that as uh, you lost your job due to a, you, so you get unemployment until you find another position. But but due to a medical yeah, condition, isn't yeah. that disability? Uh, trust me, I, I, I looked all into it. I had a lawyer <laughs> working with me. I worked with the Epilepsy Foundation because I thought it was really unfair for me to lose the job. I lost my job entirely. They fired me. They literally fired me at that point. Yeah, but you weren't in an accident. No. Because they found out you had epilepsy? Yep. Can they do that? Well, I disclosed it at that point. When they told me, why aren't you going to be able to work tomorrow? I said, I lost my CDL. They said, well, then you need, that's the qualification for the job. And I was like, well, why don't you give me a job that doesn't need a CDL? You know, like a small van or a car or just an an office job. And at that point, the insurance, because I had disclosed it, the insurance company that had covered my corporate job, and I'll leave their name out of it, but basically said, we're not going to cover them. And they fired me. Wow. And at that point, I got a, um, a lawyer and everything because I thought this was like, I can't believe you can get fired for this in America. And apparently in Colorado, you can. In Colorado, wow. you can get fired for anything. And the fact that I disclosed it myself is what got me in trouble. If I would have just said the doctor said I can't be a CDL driver anymore, that would have been different. But the fact that I said I have epilepsy, that's when I disclosed it to everybody. Wow. This leads me to where I'm at now, because as I left the doctor's office without a job, I called up a friend who grew weed, and I wanted to be a grower since the industry started. I'd been growing weed in my basement for a couple of years. I was smoking weed for a long time. I just said to myself, here's my opportunity. Obamacare had kicked in. I could go buy insurance, because the biggest reason I didn't grow weed was I needed insurance, and I couldn't buy insurance because I had a pre-existing condition, and Obamacare lifted that and allowed me to go buy insurance and yeah. be a grower. And I worked in the marijuana industry for a year and a half learning it uh, on a commercial scale because it's totally different than growing in your basement. And learning like what we talked about leadership and working with other guys and schedules, 
you know, like having your rooms come down on certain days. I mean, it's a lot different because you, everything's all in a schedule. And then there's other guys' schedule. And then the dispensary's waiting on stuff. You know, everything's very regimented. Whereas when it's in your basement, you're like, yeah, this can come down today. This plant will come down in a week. Now it's like, well, this room needs to come down on Monday. This room comes down on Tuesday, you know, right. so. Yeah, there's a power dynamic. Mm-hmm. When you're growing in your basement, you're kind of in control of your clients. Yeah. When you're growing at a dispensary, you're clients are kind of in control yep. because yep. Uh, as we were alluding to earlier, there's places right down the road yes, where they exactly. will go and very quickly go yep. if you don't have what they want. And the people up front, the dispensary people have their wants and desires for me as their grow manager. Like, hey, we need these strains. We want this much of these strains. And I try to provide that. And that means I have to start planning things 14 weeks in advance, you know, six wow. weeks of veg, eight weeks of flour. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to start planning. But once it gets into that perfect mechanics of like everything coming at the right the time flow, yeah that yeah. flow starts to work it's it's pretty cool it's, it's in the cool zone to be part of that and so yeah that's how i got to here I, I worked as a bouncer for a long time and one of the guys i knew through bouncing was the owner here at dank and actually both owners i told you that we had a the grow that i used to work at got shut down due to uncompliancy and i said i need a new job i want to keep working in this industry i've got a year under my belt now and gamut uh, the owner here was like let me get you a job came in here started out as just like their trim uh, manager like working the harvest yeah and once they saw that i had some talents in the grow we had a grow manager get fired and i just stepped into it i said you know i know these jobs i know how to do this we didn't have anybody else really in that position they didn't want to hire anybody for that position they kind of groomed me for it oh. for about six months and then i fell finally by january this year they it worked out to become the grow manager two questions how do you show you have growing skills if all you're doing is trimming tough. it's this is tough and two yeah. How do you get fired as a grow manager? What do you oh, seriously boy. have to <laughs> f up to? Uh huh. Well, let's uh, let's see. How do I say this delicately? It was within the business. The grow manager and another manager who worked here. Some internal conflict. Yeah, didn't weren't getting along, and okay. some words were used that weren't supposed to be used. That shouldn't be used in a professional setting whatsoever. And this is something that I've been seeing in this grow uh, industry. And now it's 2016, so you know we're starting to see the the weak kind of fall off to the way side here. And that's people who decide that they're a grower and that you are working in a business. Now, this is a company. They have, people can sue you. Okay. When you work in your garage, you can call people whatever you want (laughs) and do whatever you want and show up whenever you want. Uh, When you're working for a company, you're punching a clock, you're paying taxes. You can't say certain words in front of certain people and you need to watch your mouth. You need to be recognizing the fact that there's customers that could be around the corner at any time. You have to be professional. It's a business. Professional, right. Yeah. And what I noticed is uh, a few of the different managers that I've worked with at this point didn't have that ability to find what it means to be a company guy and a grower. And I have that because I worked for 12 years as a corporate guy while growing in my basement a couple of those years. So it was a good way for me to show like, hey, man, I know how to be a businessman and a grower. This guy's not professional, whatever. You know, he's not so professional. He gets fired. I see myself. I'm the trim manager. I'm getting plants that I'm seeing as I'm trimming that are like messed up one way or another. One's way heavy. Another one's light. So you're bringing up issues. I'm like, what's going on here? Which is showing that you have some knowledge. Knowledge in yeah. the area, yeah. and this is how you kind of see yeah. the fact that, and it wasn't easy because yeah. I was just supposed to be the trim guy. They, people looked at me as like maybe just a friend of the owners that they brought in, and who's this guy telling me what to do? He's just been here for a month, but I'd be seeing things that needed to be addressed one way or another. Uh, and we didn't have a manager to for me to turn to to say, hey, and we have a, ge- a general manager who's running our dispensary and our grow, yeah. and is so busy all day long. The last thing he has to worry that he can worry about is why are there yellow spots on these fan leaves? Whereas for me, I was like, you know, we've got this going on or, you know, this is a big problem. We don't, and he doesn't see that because he can't, he's too busy. The details. That's one of the reasons they needed a grow manager. And throughout that process of grinding with the other growers as the trim manager, like, Hey man, why aren't you guys doing that? Finally, they kind of saw that what needed to happen was some sort of title given to me to have people listen. At first, they just kind of made me the trim manager and a grower. Then I became a trim manager and the head grower. Then I became the trim manager and the grow manager. Now I'm 
the grow management. Yeah, you work into it step yeah. by step, and that way the transition mm. isn't so uh, abrupt and blunt for the environment, and yep. you get the chance to step into it also. Yeah. I don't want to clash with all the guys. They had been here a long time. They knew what they were doing, but they had a grow manager telling them what to do, and then he was gone. So it's hard to blame them. You know, my changes, I had a lot of changes right away that people are like, who's this guy, uh, and what's he thinking? And some of my changes worked, some didn't. The ones that were working finally gave me some credibility to be like, okay, maybe we should, yeah. start, you know, and I think that's what happened. There was something, major changes that were made in pretty quickly that was like, okay, he's got some validity to some of his tactics. Let's see what else he's got to offer. So you're officially for some months into this position, yeah. this title here. W- would you say you found your place in life in this job? That uh, Not to yeah. say you were wandering before that all those sales jobs and route jobs yeah. were, were kind of aimless, lost yeah. life. But, you know. I'll, I'll tell you this much, man. I Working in the as a corporate guy, I mean, I knew that that's not what I wanted. Yeah. But I also didn't want to be a manager of of a guy like me who I loved sales. I loved people. I love getting out there and I didn't want to be the manager because that he made less money. You worked harder. You had more stress. People don't like you. You got to write people up. There was a lot of things I didn't want to deal with. When it came to the grow side of things, I liked the idea of being a grow manager because I like having the ability to see things, diagnose them, and then implement ways of fixing problems or seeing solutions that maybe others wouldn't see. And managers in civilian life, you know, civilian life didn't offer that challenge to me where growing does, but that doesn't mean that's where I want to be the rest of my life. I Ultimately, I think every grower in the country wants to become a consultant. These consultants <laughs> make a lot of money. Money, walking around telling people what they're doing wrong, and then they walk out the door and they just made a bunch of money. You don't, you know, if you look at me right now, my I got dirty knees, my socks are wet, <laughs> my hands have got calluses. You know, I've been doing stuff all day long, watering, my neck itches. You know, that's the type of stuff that I don't have any problem doing. I love hard work, but I would love to be able to just walk into a place and be like, yeah, do this, do this, and put it like this, do that. Okay, see you later, and make a thousand bucks. You know, <laughs> all in time though, right? That's a very realistic end goal yeah. or just a future future place right. to be in life. Get the experience, get the, the jobs, the credits, the mistakes, yep. you know, every everything that you kind of need to yep. to teach somebody else. Mistakes are major. I don't, I mean, I don't even listen to a grower if they tell me they know everything. You know, if they tell me that they've never had a problem, I don't believe them. Like I told you, I used to be a bouncer and I would tell other bouncers when they'd be like, what kind of martial art should I train in? Or what do I do? <laughs> what workout should I do to get tougher, to be a better bouncer? And I would tell them to go get their ass kicked. You know, you don't learn how to be tough until you get your butt kicked. And in this industry, you can't learn to be a good rower until you get your butt kicked by some disease, some bug, something will do it to you where you're like, I'm never letting that happen again. That's right. And that's how you learn. Pain don't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You got it. But if you, you know what I mean there is if you got to have some humility, you got to be ready to learn. Uh, And if somebody's telling me that they know everything, there's no chance of believing a word that they say. You know, nobody knows everything. Guys that have been growing for 35 years, will tell you, I'm still learning. That's the guy that you want to listen to. You know? One of my favorite movies as a kid, Roadhouse. Yeah, I know. Uh, Patrick Swayze, baby. Uh, you know, that movie inspired me to almost, almost uh-huh. want to pursue a, a career in the high life of bouncing. Oh, yeah. But Let then I realized uh, very quickly. What there. was his name? Dun- not Duncan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Duncan? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Dalton. Dalton, yes. yes. Dalton. Yeah, believe it or not, my <laughs> uncle's best friend taught him uh, martial arts for that movie. Really? Yeah, it's in the credits. His name's Randy Hall. You can watch the look at the credits. He he was the stunt coordinator for the movie Roadhouse. His name's Randy <laughs> Hall. Yep. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that movie's a classic. Yep. I don't think anybody could ever talk about any type of bouncing yep. or anything without, without referencing yeah. or, or thinking of that movie. Yeah. Well, my buddies were calling me Roadhouse for a long time uh, <laughs> after seeing my moves. <laughs> Your moves. Uh, what, what do you practice? You study a martial? Arts? No, no. no? I'm a, uh, in fact, like I told you, I have the epilepsy, so yeah. I, I had to stop playing football and high school and college and no martial arts. I love yeah. UFC stuff. I watch mixed martial arts. A lot of my friends practice that stuff and I'm really into watching it. But if I, a simple headbutt, and I think this is why I got tough was because I, I knew a punch to the face or a kick to the head could end my life. I mean, yeah. I can have a seizure and die. So I got tough that way, you know, yeah. just knowing like I got to protect my head or avoid fights. 
Avoid, yeah, but that's part of it. And guess what? Yeah. Sales. Well, how do you think sales <laughs> fall in? You know, I was a I was a salesman and a bouncer, and I'm really good at both. Yeah. And that's part of it is learning how to not fight. Like especially just talk your way out of it. It's usually the best way to win a fight. You yeah. know. Well, you might enjoy Aikido. Yeah. You, you might enjoy that style of martial art. There's that's more self defense and very little contact. Yeah. It's it's mostly falling and throwing type yeah. stuff, but very little contact. Yeah. Um, as far as kicking and punching. Yeah, I've goes. had people say judo as well. That's well, judo is a slightly I mean, you were talking about aggression versus non-aggression. Yeah. Uh, if we're looking for non-aggressive stuff, uh, judo, judo may not. I mean, judo yeah. doesn't have punches and kicks, but I would not say it's a non-aggressive. Yeah, you're right. It's a judo is very aggressive. Yeah. Uh, just like jujitsu or, yeah. or any other derivative of those. But aikido yeah. is a pretty uh, specific art that's intended to to be non-damaging to mm-hmm. both yourself and the other person intentionally. Yeah. Meaning your attacker is intentionally not being harmed by you. And that's that's a derivative of like yeah. Taekwondo, is that right? No, oh. it's a uh, Aikido coming from Japan, uh-huh. Taekwondo from Korea. Korea yeah. Taekwondo is typically the real high kicks and spinning kicks and uh-huh. jumps and stuff. Uh, Aikido is is a lot of circular movements and throws. Okay. So it's a lot of moving out of the way and then having people fall due to their own momentum type stuff. Yeah. Similar concepts of judo, judo yeah. but without joint locks and bends and holds and okay. big you know, big Throws. damaging type uh, wrestling style type moves. Yeah. Aikido, I, I'm hesitating to use the word passive, but uh, it's probably one of the few and only arts that is intended to protect your attacker. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not right. too much. Like, just, just enough. <laughs> well, it, it's all based on throws. So it's uh-huh. based on, on somebody attacking Get you. Get away from me. You moving out of the way. Yeah person falling to the ground type yeah. of stuff but yeah that might be interesting if yeah, you're looking into that man. something like that and you know more peaceful arts um in, in that style and but, i'm a hippie at heart so that's good yeah. <laughs> but these are the kind of things that actually contribute to being a good leader yeah because a good leader is somebody that has that kind of well-rounded experience mm-hmm. you know curious about many things has many interests and cares about other people's lives yeah. and interest and, and and genuinely tries to help people get to what they want to do or what yep. they're trying Trying to do. That's what I try to do, groom them. Yeah. I hate to say it like this, but I try to groom them to be more like me. You know, like I feel like I I was taught a certain way to work. I grew up on a farm and stuff. So it's uh, my work ethic. I'm pretty proud of. And I think anybody who knows me would say I've got a good work ethic. But um, we got uh, anybody who works underneath me. I'd like him to be where I don't have to be so, criti- you know, I'm not critiquing them as much because they're a little bit more like the way I want myself to work and want them to work. And I can't be too hard on somebody who works just like me, you know. Right, and that's my job as manager is to get people working the way I'd like them to without having to be such a micromanager, you know, <laughs> and telling people what to do all the time. I'd rather it just be, hey, I'm going to let you do your thing. I trust you because I've groomed you to be a better worker. And, and this is why the most talented people are not necessarily the best managers because you may have all the growing talents in the world, but if you can't communicate with other people mm-hmm. and work in a group, your growing skills don't amount to much right. in an organization type setup. I think what you're explaining is pretty valuable stuff because right. I, I do talk to a lot of people who do kind of have that mindset you're talking about is, yeah. I'm the best in the world. Nobody yeah. can tell me anything. I've never made a mistake. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And a lot of it might be immaturity, but I think a lot of it is just lacking what you very clearly said, having your ass kicked. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. And, and all metaphorical senses yeah. and literal. Yeah. But in, in a very metaphorical sense, you know, have you ever had your ass kicked in business have you ever gone broke you ever yeah. filed bankruptcy you yeah. ever put all your money on the line and, and lost it yeah. you ever gone out doing sales of your business yeah. and had all the doors slammed in your face right. until you couldn't afford That's to the eat other thing. yeah <laughs> it was one of the jobs i had was selling alarms the adt adt yeah. knocking on doors in downtown phoenix arizona at like seven o'clock at night as the sun is setting i'm knocking on doors asking people if i can come in to see their house and try to sell them <laughs> the security alarm and you look like everybody who's in those commercials <laughs> You're like the the uh, middle class white dude yeah. from from Ohio or yeah, Iowa, Iowa yeah. who has the uh, scruffy beard yeah. and a pulled over beanie cap halfway right. over his head. You know, looking suspiciously around yeah. the uh, house. You look like the yeah. commercials. Let me uh, let me in. Let me in. Right. I've had that job where you get the, the door slammed in your face. Yeah. Like, yeah, f you, dude. You're not coming to my house. Try to sell me an alarm. Well, this, yeah. if you showed up looking.
looking more criminal like uh-huh. that might be a different story <laughs> yeah right so yeah. if you showed up looking like an actual thug and a criminal and not this kind of hollywood casting <laughs> kind of uh <laughs> criminal that's yeah. breaking in your house late at night as the cat burglar yeah but if you showed up looking like a drugged out thug, yeah. people might think about their security. Yeah, in their you're home. right, or or think <laughs> twice about what. Why, why am I letting this guy stand on my porch this long? Well, that's what you need a. Sh- uh, what do I call him a, a shill. A shill. You you need somebody first to go up to uh-huh. the door and be like, "Hey, can I use your phone?" And just be drugged out and uh-huh. crazy looking, and then we'll instantly have the impression, "Oh, who the hell are these people right. in the neighborhood?" And then you could come up ten minutes later and be like, "Hey, I'm representing security <laughs> systems, right?" And you'll have your your perfect uh, team action there. Yeah, so that was one job that it, it got me to the point of learning rejection. I was a personal trainer for a minute. That's pretty tough too. You know, trying to sell yourself for 75 bucks an hour is not easy. So learning to take rejection was similar to me starting out as a grower and getting my butt kicked by spending time and money on something and then everything going to crap and being like, what did I do wrong? What did I, what, what just happened? And if you don't have those experiences in your back pocket, it might happen to you when you're working for me, when there's going to be 15 or 20 pounds coming down, you know, this week. And when I lose four plants in my basement, it's one thing, which it was a big deal then, but, you know, losing 72 plants or 108 plants and having 30 pounds on the line when the week of 420, you know, like this, this is the type of thing that I need good workers to know. Like we need you to have these failures in your bat in your past. So I can depend on the fact that you're going to see a forecast of this could possibly happen. I'm not going to let it happen. You know, absolutely. I mean, you are without overstating it, the life and blood of, of a dispensary. Yeah. Without a grow, there is no dispensary. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Well, well, there's wholesaling. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess that that's maybe yeah. not a correct statement said like that. Yeah. Without a grower uh-huh. somewhere, there well, is no you know, business. Let me tell you this. I, I think that the grows, the dispensaries that just use the uh, the wholesaling or they you know depend mostly on wholesale, one thing I feel like is you don't get an identity with that dispensary. Our yeah. dispensary, we have you know about 50 strains that we have, but maybe 16 or 18 of them are our go-to strains people know us for and people come around for. And through the process of becoming the new manager, we noticed that our signature strains were starting to... Branding. Yeah. yeah, The strains that people really came in for started to have some struggles. And it was really important that we get our strains that people identify us with, get them back into being a a stronger strain or that strain, the potency and uh, potential that it had in the past. Right. Where people were coming around calling, hey, do you guys have some of that dragon in? You got that that Durban in? And when you have more and more strains, you lose your identity. And all of a sudden you have 50 different things. It's like, well, that guy, they, they grow this, they grow all these different things. What I like knowing for us is we have like this core group of strains that are really strong that we do really, really well yielding and potency-wise that are tasty, um, they smoke well, they taste good, and you get people coming back for. That was one of my first priorities, was getting those strains dialed back in, getting our identity back. Kind of bring this back to what we talked about earlier with the logo. You know, we got a new logo, and it was kind of good timing because I became the new manager. We had new strains, which are, it's always good to offer new strains, but we also got our old go-tos back. And it wasn't new, you know, it was newer than it had been. It right. was it was better than it had been. And right. things things turned around and we started to see, uh, even on my side, taking the stuff home and being like, wow, this tastes a lot better than it did two months ago yeah. or three months ago or four months, a year ago. So um, J- it, just because you remodel your house doesn't mean your house is falling apart. Right. It just means right. you're giving it a facelift. Yeah, exactly. it's, just, uh, it's just a refresher. This is probably your background of the sales bleeding into that mm-hmm. mentality of really thinking about the brand and the identity and mm-hmm. how the product itself is really being used yeah. as a sales tool. You're yeah. using the product itself to yeah. sell dank. You yeah. know, you're not you're not selling a name, you're selling a product right. here. So that's probably some of that background right. coming in. Well, in my mindset, my goal is to get people in here and get them excited about new things. So I need my old stuff that was really good to get people through the door. Yeah. And whether they want to buy t-shirts, hats, you know, paraphernalia, or they want to try out a new strain that looks good on the shelf that they had never heard of. Yeah. Well, it, it took me getting those go-to strains dialed in 
to get somebody through the door and be like, oh, we'll take some of this other stuff too because we know this is good. Yeah. You know, I've had this before. This is good. Well, we'll try some of this. You know, I kind of think about it like a 7-Eleven where they don't make any money on the gas, um, but, you know, you buy a candy bar, you right. buy a slushie. And you have to go inside to pay, or you used to, right? Yeah, you used right. to have you're, to go inside to pay. You're doing <laughs> these other things that get the people through the door, though. Yeah. And for me, my three things I'm always working on is potency, how much, you know, so yield, and then taste. So uh, those are the three things that I focus on and that's what you're going to start seeing changes with the products here and we've already started seeing it. Well, let's talk about this for a second because uh, as a grower, you probably have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of questions based on this idea of what is a strain, right? Yeah. As far as naming goes, not not what is it in the technical aspect, but as far as names go. Yeah. Because uh, the branding and yeah. the identity is very important and people do look for certain names because they're yeah. associating those names with certain reactions they've gotten from what they they've tried mm-hmm. but the reality is if i have a og kush here mm-hmm. at dank and i go five miles south yep. and buy an og kush the reality is they're not going to be the same thing no which Maybe. is very different mm-hmm. than buying a coors light at exactly. the Seven Eleven on this corner driving five miles and buying a coors right. light it's going to be coors light yeah so the reality is is when it comes to names there's very little to stand on yeah. as far as what well, does it I, I'm really glad mean. You brought it up because that's what I'm talking about is when we have certain strains that people search out for and they like it here and they don't like it down the street and they love Durban poison, but our Durban poison's better than the guy down the street or our, our it test higher or the smoke quality is better or we flush better, you know, and we l- use less pesticides. Any of those type of things, quality and, and uh, snobby weed grower or smokers, they pick up on these things. What color the ash is at the end of your bowl? <laughs> you know, is it white? Is it black? Is it not uh, burning well? Do you, when, you, when you exhale it, does it burn in your throat? You know, these are different different things where if I bought a bottle of Jim Beam at one liquor store and it made me want to throw up and I go to another one, I'd go, you know what I mean? Like that's my idea is to get these strains that people are searching out for that we were, we knew were popular. Right. That for a reason. We, all these dispensaries around here are growing those same strains and they come to us for something, for some reason. And, you know, I try not to think about it as price. A lot of it might be price, but I'd like to think about it as quality because for me, when I'm buying marijuana, whether it's here or up in the mountains at a different dispensary when I can't pop in here is I'm looking for that Durban poison or that master Kush that gets me all those certain things that I had listed and makes me happy at yeah. the end of it, at the, the process the, of everything combined, the taste, the smoke quality, all that stuff. At the end of the day, am I going to buy it again? Will I go back there? You know, we talked earlier about yelping bad, you know, not everybody's going to yell. They'll just choose not to come back. Right. And if I can get somebody to come back here who maybe who hadn't been in here for a long time because the quality had fallen off one way or another it's my job to get these people back through the door yeah you know and that's why i mean like right now we're trying to get people to come back especially people who live in the neighborhood here or who have came into dank and maybe tried it out a couple of years ago they liked it never came back i'm offering an invitation to anybody to come back in we have um, coupons right now in culture and dope we carry both those magazines here in the house and if you come down here to dank go and ask for one of those magazines you'll be able to get one of those coupons and use it right away uh, let them know that you heard the podcast and uh, we'll get you a better discount better deal and hopefully you like the product enough that you'll come back and give us a second chance so. let's create a, a special one right now on the spot okay. for only people listening to yeah. us yeah. That, that's created right now just between me and you okay so how about this Somebody that would only know about this, who's listened to you and I speaking right now, Uh would have to come in and say a phrase or something. Yeah. And the only people that would know that is uh, because I'm not going to put it on Facebook. I'm not going to write it anywhere. It's only going to be right now in this 10 second conversation. Let's do something that Mm -hmm. you would know about. And then I guess you can inform whoever else needs to be and just make a special little CCP radio uh, promotion that can just cut through everything and let people know that the promotion is coming from this conversation. They we heard could just you. say this, um, uh, friends and family of the podcast. That would probably be one way to show that you heard it here 
and that you're interested in giving us a second chance and or or your first time ever but maybe you got excited after hearing about this through the podcast you come in you say you're friends and family of the podcast i'll let all the bud tenders know and the managers know that there's a new special in the house and we can knock 20 percent off right away wow so you have to say a friend of the podcast yes. and you don't have to say it's the cannabis community project podcast but if they ask which one yeah. i guess go ahead and tell them uh-huh. at the end of the hall yeah because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people don't know i'm down here there, yeah. i mean it's a facility a lot of people i'm not here throughout the week you know you could mention that you heard your <laughs> we heard the new head grower on your pod on the on a podcast and he said to come down for a 20 percent discount yeah right. and just tell him because i'm a friend of the show yeah right there you go. And, and we'll we'll find out a way to cut through but only you're going to get it if you're listening I'm yeah. not going to write it anywhere. It's not nope. going to be on a blog. It's not going to be on a Facebook. I'm and, not and gonna Twitter. I haven't gotten that approved, but we're going to make sure it happens. <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll make sure it we'll happens. We'll come up with a whole bunch of stuff. I, I was told to there. promote, and that's how we're going to promote. <laughs> that's how we're going to promote. So come on down and check us out. You know, just jumping back real quick. So what, it, what we need to do is somehow create a system where the name itself identifies the quality. For uh-huh. example... Mad Dog 2020. Uh-huh. Just the name. <laughs> Do I have to go, well, are we talking about the store in Colorado Springs or the store up uh, in Park Hill? Because yeah. that Mad Dog, yeah. right? The name itself says it all. Yeah. So what we need to do is somehow create a system where the name is associated with the level or quality or placement of what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, it's tough because, uh, and I'm glad this is the case, Is and this comes from genetics too, and you might have a, a stronger genetic and your phenotypes are, are different with every strain. So if my sour diesel or Durban poison, I use Durban poison because it's one of the original strains and mm-hmm. there's a, a wide array of where that genetic has evolved. And some people have really strong genetics and they, that plant is resilient and yields a ton. It's super tasty. It's just gorgeous. You know, it's one of those, it's like flowers or tomatoes or anything else. You know, the genetic means a lot. And what you're not just like, we can, you were talking about alcohol, but that's a brand thing, you know, that comes to one big batch of Coors Light is Coors Light, but a tomato is a tomato at one grocery store and the tomato right next to it and that same grocery store might not be as good, but right. it might have came from a different grower, the where that was grown. Country of the region. Yeah, yeah. But it's like here in Colorado, we have o- Olathe corn. Right? Uh-huh. The name, the brand mm-hmm. signifies the corn of uh, the genetic quality, yeah. right? If we said, hey, w- how's the corn in Colorado versus the corn in New York? Mm-hmm. Well, then it would be a very, well, you know, it's, it's debatable. Yeah. But if we said, how's the Olathe corn? Mm-hmm. Well, then we're talking about a very specific right. grow from a specific region yeah. with, with a specific gene plan, yeah. I guess. But if you this. take that Olathe corn kernel that yeah. you're, and plant it in Iowa or you plant it in Texas, it's not going to be the same tasting corn. It, even though it comes from that same genetic, it was grown differently with different uh, environmental yeah. factors. Different now, sun, different right. water, different soil. everything, air quality, everything goes humidity, all that stuff. And when it comes to growing marijuana, is you need to find genetics that are strong because they'll fight diseases and and they're more resilient for bugs or potency and yields. All these, you know, there's certain reasons we do certain things. But just because I have a really great genetic doesn't mean it's going to be great unless I've maximized the potential of that genetic. And that means the different environment, what type of water I'm giving it, what type of nutrients. Are we flushing it properly? Are we giving the plant everything that it can to maximize its potential through its genetics? You know, if you take your genetics and your parents are two bodybuilders and then you eat potato chips your whole life, you're not going to be a bodybuilder. But if you eat eggs and chicken breasts and work out, great body. You, you, you see what I mean? Like <laughs> I do. I'm actually doing this experiment right now with my eating two potato kids. chips all day. No, no, I, yeah. I'm doing the uh, alcohol versus weed. Uh, when, <laughs> when when my daughter was born, I was living in Mexico. Mexico, and I was pretty much on an alcohol-only diet yeah. uh, for a number of years. And people really don't believe me when I say this, but as just an individual, it's it's not easy getting individual smoke in Mexico. Yeah, it's it's not easy. They're not a smoking culture. No, they're a drinking culture. Yeah, with a little bit of cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, not necessarily a smoking culture. Yeah. So if you're just looking for a dime bag, it's not easy. Right. It's, you got to deal with shady people and get yeah. shitty weed, and it's just not not a system. So as a result, I, I was pretty much on a drinking-only diet for a number of years. My daughter was born. My son, who was just born 10 months ago here in the U.S., was born under almost the complete opposite 
circumstances. One hundred percent cannabis consumption, zero percent alcohol wow. for a number of years. So now, as they grow up, I'm going to see how they yeah. are drawn to alcohol, yeah. weed. You know how their personalities develop. I'm going to do my own unscientific experiment. Uh-huh. I, I guess I've already done it in a sense. <laughs> yeah, you've already you've already deposited yeah, that. I've already done it. But uh, it's the same thing. You know, we're going to see uh-huh. how genetics affects things. And, and, and you're from, right. Maximizing the potential of genetic is always what I'm trying to do. So in like with what you are doing, you are feeding yourself poison <laughs> and I'm guessing you mean your fish obviously are still swimming. Things were things were working. So we'll see your daughter obviously has ten fingers, ten toes and <laughs> right. you know, it wasn't it wasn't that obvious. So right, right. for with marijuana what you see is stunted growth. You would see uh, more bugs, more powdery mildew, you would have more problems. Yeah. Um, and that's just my son. No, <laughs> But, you know, that's what I'm looking for is to maximize what, you know, and and we don't have the best genetics on every single strain we have. And that's because you don't know what you're getting a lot of times. You can only hope for if I go to a grow that I know and I trust and I say, hey, we are going to do a trade here of we'll give you 10 of our clones for 10 of your clones. You know, that's when you say to yourself, "Okay, I'm going to take a gamble by bringing this in, by bringing this in, I bringing in a stranger's what he had been doing. Um, and it, the worst thing that can happen is that could change your whole garden. That one clone that you bring. everything. Everything. Yeah. Or that might be the best strain ever. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you are in magazines across the country and we're talking about it on your podcast about how <laughs> did you get this 36%, two pounds of plant light, you know, whatever it is. But that can happen. So it's a gamble. It's, it's part of a, a gamble that takes place and maximizing the best, your, your genetics is what you always want to do. Well, from a technical standpoint, since you mentioned trading clones, mm-hmm. uh, some people are interested in this, and I don't know how technical it is, but you clone, you don't mother plant, right? We do mother. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we clone off of our mothers. What I was bringing, what I'm talking about is bringing in new strains. Uh, to, so all of our mothers are as is. You know, we've got a, um, basically like 100 mothers. So every batch you're taking from a mother mm-hmm. or you're mm-hmm. starting from new clippings? We call them cuttings or clippings, okay. and that turns into a clone. We put it into a, a like a it's root right little root ball okay. with a little bit of hormone on it. I'm there. asking because yeah. of the genetics because I've heard that if you mother plant the genetics will break down yeah. over time. They recede. Um, whereas you know if you say hey I have a you know a ten year old mother plant that uh-huh. may not necessarily signify a better quality. It may mm-hmm. actually say the opposite that because it's been ten years of constantly uh-huh. taking from it, taking from it, taking from it, that it's been breaking down genetically. Yeah. And I'm not a grower yeah. <laughs> as you might be well, no, that's right. understanding very quickly. But uh, as you're cloning, you're kind of starting fresh without that uh, breakdown happening in the process. Well, I think it's a matter of terminology here because um, cloning, we're cloning our mother plants. We're taking a clipping off of mother plant and we make that a clone. That becomes the same genetic as it was. And when- Which is different than just pruning away from your mother plant and then letting that replenish or well i mean you have obviously there's people who use seeds okay okay and you plant you can grow from a seed which is the the best genetic that's your that's your genetic at its best to start from seed to start right and you aren't going to find that much in a commercial grow uh, it's too just, it's long too difficult scary. To... yeah you don't want seeds around you know it's it gets nerve-wracking a lot longer process as well okay so i'm i'll be the first one to admit that the genetics are always receding, but that's also why you keep in touch with other growers to say, hey, I'm ready to get some new genetics in here. And when you do that, you take on whatever they have at that point, and you'll start receding from there. But it takes a long time. We try to every year update all our stuff. You know, our moms we keep around for a few months. It's actually about six months or so, and then we try to update our moms. And all the mom is is that mother. You know, that plant that becomes a new mom came from the mom that it's getting replaced from. Okay. So it's the terminology cloning and mother. I mean, that's we're still doing the same. That's still one thing. Right. Mothers are clones. You know, we're cutting clone clippings from a mother uh, right. becoming a clone. For some reason, I thought it was you were clipping from the plants themselves that were growing before they were actually chopped uh-huh. and clipped. So reuse those rather than going back that. to the mother. Yep. Some people do that, and that saves a lot of space. And you can do that. We've yeah. done that. We don't seem to have a problem with it. But what we do like knowing is, let's say you have a, a block. We call it a block. But let's say your veg garden gets poisoned. 
for some whatever reason. Your lights went out. You, I don't know, whatever. I, I don't even want to know yeah. what could happen. Things can happen, though. Um, but then yeah. last week with the snowstorm, you yeah, went out Yeah, with 32 hours. hours 32 yeah. hours. But let's say you had a bad employee, threw some bleach, and killed all your, your <laughs> veg, okay? So you have a mother garden that backs up your genetics. Now, some people decide not to use a mother garden, and they only clip from the plant while in veg. So let's say for some reason you forgot to take a clipping of your master kush and now your master kush is all in flower you can't take a clipping from that you just lost your master kush so it's a backup it's kind of a backup right okay. and for a commercial grow it's nice because our moms are huge plants with a ton of tops on it our uh, propagation guy can come through take 200 clones you know 50 uh, a space queen 50 sour diesel and maybe 15 we can pick and choose from quality right you know this one rooted better than this one we throw this one away we keep this one well if you're taking tops from just your veg it's really difficult to say hey i'm going to take a hundred of these you don't want to take you know that's a lot of your tops of your garden you're kind of forced to use stuff that you might not have normally used it might not be that highly your the rooting might have not been well once they start taking maybe they start getting spots or rust on it and you're like oh shoot i got this you know this whole strain is going to be crap well what you end up having is the ability with us we get these moms that are backed up yeah Um, and i can go over and say hey let's take 50 tops Tops from our moms, and, and we'll pick 15 of them when they're uh, 15 of the best ones. So here it is again, going back to quality and how I can keep up with that standard of keeping our customers happy is by saying, "Hey, we're giving you the best that we got." Yeah, you know, I had a hundred different tops I could have given you. We took you the 15 best ones, and you just throw away the other ones. It's kind of crazy, but <laughs> you know, not, not literally throw them away. Literally throw them away. You don't <laughs> use them all, other purpose. No, we have to throw them away. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's it's God. difficult, I man. Hate it's inefficiency. Tough. Well, it's the inefficiency there, you'll find in commercial growing, there's a whole lot of inefficiency, and it's based on trying to get the best. Yeah. Product. But I look at that as that's not that inefficient to me. Yeah. We might have used uh, five gallons of water on those little tiny clones that, you know, 200 clones and we used 50 of them. So 150 got thrown away. Right. How many of those, how much water did I use? How many nutrients did I use? But what I did get was the 50 best yeah. ones out of, you know what I mean? It's kind of like a, the process that we go through to get the best. Well, when I say uh, other use, I mean like can they be mulched for paper? Can they oh. be made into twigs for art? I mean, um, just just used rather than yeah. literally thrown out. I mean, <laughs> not I, not they have to be made into edibles. Not that yeah. kind of use. Just there. I mean, we're we we're use. talking a, a plant that's maybe four <laughs> inches tall at this point. Yeah, um, with maybe an inch of roots. Yeah, that it's not are even in a really little cube. Um, nothing there. Yeah. Do you um, compost your own? Yeah, you we your, have a. Yeah. That's part of the d- thing that we do here. We're pretty environmentally conscious, so we have a. We don't do it ourselves, but we have a guy. I come in yeah. and mulch everything and we weigh everything everything's tracked and kept up and yeah. he keep he has to track his side of it yeah. on on um the recycling side of it it's a so, lot yeah I, I, which i don't think people really realize it yeah. even if you're a home grower which i'm sure when you were a home yeah. grower thinking oh, man. about hey i could be a grower at dispensary <laughs> yeah. give me that yeah. freaking job there wasn't know? such <laughs> a thing as a, a, a dispensary it was called the dude down the street you're right. um but we used to go searching dumpsters in alleys for to throw <laughs> stuff away you know we'd get our cars filled up with all the trim and all this potting and everything and then go find some dumpster like three miles away and throw it in there doing it little by little like yep. andy dufresne uh with yep. the dirt out of his pants <laughs> from the shot right little right. by little trying to get rid of your evidence you have well, to yeah this is why i laugh at people when they tell me they're gonna grow their own and sell it to dispensaries i'm like yeah. who, what dispensary are you talking you to who um, the hell is gonna actually, buy your you home can, grow? you can in washington <laughs> um that's the way they're they're letting it the, how we used to be able right. to do is you used to be able to grow it here, walk into a dispensary with with two pounds of your backpack and yeah. sell it to them because it had to be at at that point. Uh-huh. But you're talking about a legal standpoint. Yeah, you can't I'm, no. forget the law. Yeah. I'm saying, would you ever accept just some stranger no. randomly walking no. in saying, "Hey, you want to buy my pound no, of and weed?" This, you know, kind of <laughs> bring it back to us. This is what we, um, my job, I try to do is like I do not want us buying wholesale because if some guy comes in here and buys the wholesale product sitting on the shelf and gets sick from it, yeah. it makes us look bad. Oh yeah. Or, this can happen too, is if they love it and it was really good and 
that we night. can't offer, you know. So there's that side of it too, but more importantly is the safety side. It's a lose lose situation. If people could get sick. We don't know where it's coming from. Like I talked about our culture of compliance that yeah. we have. I know what's going on. I'm in charge of everything from the the plant coming down uh, or the plant growing yeah. to the plant getting trimmed to the plant getting pre weighed is all happening here in the house. So right. everything's you know, we know what's happening. And the stuff that I'm smoking on the weekends or at night coming off my shelf, I know where it came from. Right. Me, <laughs> us, yeah. um, my guys, our, our newt line, our pesticide-free line. You I, know, like, I just can't believe how many people still have this mentality, though, yeah. Mentality though that they, they have an acre of land. They're going to grow weed and yeah. sell it to dispensaries. That's, I, uh, I don't Johnny know where lately. they're coming right. from. I don't know where they're what they're thinking mm-hmm. they obviously don't understand how the industry works right um, and they miss their window is what they did <laughs> yeah they by a few their, years yeah, they yeah. miss their window go find washington portland um you know go to another city that's cool like denver that's about to legalize because uh, that's what you are looking for if you want to get your anchor your acre going where they need the supply yeah because nowadays here yeah. we got com- there's so many people that are offering wholesale because you got all these guys that got into it with huge hundred thousand square foot warehouses and you know they don't have anywhere to sell the weed now (laughs) and they're trying to get rid of it so dispensaries are picking it up through wholesale so good luck trying to compete with that guy exactly you know and that guy's a millionaire who who doesn't care doesn't know how to grow weed he's just a businessman right i mean good luck trying to compete with that guy and you're out in your acre farm right um competing with this guy who's got automated system with barometers and cell phone activity he can right. start watering with his cell phone i mean this is what's happening out oh, there yeah. you know i see i see the products yeah. every day more and more people yeah. are inventing their own self-contained grow boxes yeah. put in your home oh, push yeah, the I one last night, man, it was a, it looked like a coffin that stands <laughs> up and it tur- it turns into darkness. So there's like a light and it turns and then it opens back up and a mister comes down. I mean, I, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Why didn't I think of this? You know, well, somebody didn't. That's what I'm. Well, I mean, that's what I'm waiting for. I think that's yeah. what everybody's waiting for is just the whole microwave version yeah. of, of weed. Right. Yeah. So with that, I mean, would you agree that if technology were to advance to the point where everybody could have a self-producing cannabis, something in home, that's what people would do? I do. Okay. I think that um, I have my my mom, um, I have relatives that have all said, I just like the way it looks or yeah. it's, it smells or it's a pretty plant. Um, I have a neighbor who neither one of them, both, they don't smoke weed. They haven't for years, but they have a huge garden. They want me to get them some clones because they want to just grow it, uh. and they said they'd give it to me. But it's just a big problem. It's just a big plant that they had never used before. Yeah. You know that they've never got to grow, and they've done onions and potatoes and squash and all these things. They just say it's a beautiful plant. Well, I can't imagine it not getting to the point where somebody who says I'm going to grow tomatoes, I'm going to grow my cannabis, and if it's in this little self-contained unit. Um, all the better, you know, and I'll tell you where I think the evolution's going is I think there'll become a time where there's like a service industry where, you know, I, I used to service people, uh, their water, um, you know, five gallon jugs of water, you know, I'd show up to their house, deliver water, give them new water, um, the water machines. And, you know, you had your little, you know, water containers with the spigots on it and stuff. Okay. So I think what it's going to go to is people will have self-contained marijuana growing in their house and then have somebody come and service it you know change out the reservoirs give it pesticides whatever it needs like a doctor you know is just coming to do the weekly checkup on the plant and like having a gardener it'll just yeah, be an gardener. affordable service yeah. like a lawn maintenance uh, or a lawn and a monthly fee of yeah. 200 bucks and then you know you get the weed when it's done right. or something like that and you're doing it in your backyard so all your friends can come over and look at it and you know <laughs> whatever so with that in mind uh-huh. that we both kind of agree the industry is going to a point where the commodity is going to get cheaper. People are going to become have more access to it. It's going to become more available. Mm-hmm. How is a business like a dispensary going to stay in the long run competing against what inevitably yeah. is going to happen, yeah. which, which are two things. The, the price is going to get very, very cheap. Mm. 
and people are just going to have more direct access where they may not need the storefront per se, Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's delivery services, home plant, machines, push button type stuff, growers and home or service people come by, whatever it is, it's going to get cheaper and easier. You know, I don't know about that only because uh, what I look at is the alcohol market. You know, you have people making craft beers in their house now in their basements and their garage. Maybe that's a hobby type thing, but you still go to the store to pick up beer (laughs) for the weekend. And I think that'll happen in a very very slow process right. it's not cheap to grow marijuana it just isn't uh, overhead for um, lighting and all that stuff is pretty expensive where people i don't know are going to make that initial investment to say hey i'm going to smoke that much weed through the year like because nowadays there's no black market really to get rid of it you're not going to sell it to your friend because he can go down with this coupon that he just get at, on, off your podcast <laughs> and go get 20 percent off and pay 20 bucks for an eighth of weed you know you i don't see where there's a market for it as much as maybe i Oh, I, this is weed I grew. And, you know, you have maybe a, a half pound or a pound a, a year or something that you have sitting around, but it's not much variety. You're still right. going to stop in and get a pre-roll or dabs or whatever. So I think that it'll be a slow evolution. I don't think we'll lose that much in the market, but the interest, I think it will be growing. Like the interest to get into craft brewery, uh, brewing and having people brew their own beer, it's it's grown. But I promise you, every guy who's making beer in their garage is drinking some sort of alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol throughout the week, you know, somewhere along the line, they're buying booze or they made whiskey or they're making uh, beer. They're going to go buy whiskey, you know, so I, I don't see the market so much dwindling because other people get interested in growing weed. So Dank is secure for the, I, I, for I the I near so. future. Yeah. Play with the new <laughs> grow manager here. You know, we should be doing real good. That was a lot of information. Mm. I think we really learned a lot about Dank and the grow from a from a different standpoint. Yeah. Um, obviously, we could have gotten into many details about how you grow and, and the fine points yeah. of growing. But uh, this isn't a growing show. Show. Yeah, that gets pretty technical out there and boring. That can yeah. Listen to, to to learn about how to grow, but maybe there's a business in the future for Dank yeah. of holding growing classes. Yeah, or something. I mean, else. one thing I'd like to promote though, when it comes to our product itself, something that I'm very proud of is all the hard work and uh, and effort that goes into keeping. A lower. We we try to use everything as organic as possible. We try to use everything as uh, clean. We flush everything as much as possible. Try to make the product as healthy as it can be. Uh, the highest quality that it can be. And without getting too technical, that's a lot of work. It's yeah. hard to do that. It's really easy to have things be done for you, push a button, and the product doesn't come out as good, but you just made yourself a couple thousand dollars in product. Okay. Right. I try to be really mindful of the quality of it, and I want to be proud of it, and I want to be, you know brag about it. So you know, let me give take this opportunity to brag about our hard work and say, you know, give us a shot to see how we compare to someone else that you might buy a different a bigger grow. You know, we use a kind of the boutique, the marijuana boutique ideology of it's this, not this huge warehouse. We've got a smaller, you know, we do everything hand watered. We, that means we're lifting all these plants every day to make sure to see how much water they need instead of giving it a ton of water when it doesn't need it. We're lifting it to see, okay, it just needs this much. We do certain tests to find out if it needs nutrient or not. You know, so there's different things that we can do on our end to make it's a lot harder work, but it makes a product that much better. I give a lot of pro- Props to our guys that do that. All our growers have a lot harder job than some of these other growers do, you know. So I'd like to give that, at least just say that without getting too technical, that (laughs) it does a lot of hard work goes into a better product. Well, let me take the opportunity to encourage everybody to come down and try out this hard work. I would love it. In person at Uh 3835 Elm Street, Denver. Come try out the new grow managers hard work yes come check out the new logo yeah come see me at the studio end of the hall and make sure to tell them that you're a friend of the show yeah get your discount if they're confused what show just point to the end of the hall and say the podcast down that way very cool, man. Well, I appreciate your time, and I've taken a lot of it, so I hope we haven't killed any plants by nope. keeping you here too long. <laughs> nope, I got that team. My, our, our team is doing a great job, and I, I could easily come down here and talk longer if you wanted me to, but I'm sure you don't. Well, please come back, yeah. um, because uh, I think people want to know more and more about behind the scenes, yeah. right? behind the scenes of a dispensary. Yeah. Uh, we don't necessarily have to teach people how to grow. And literally behind the dispensary. Our grow is in behind our dispensary, so <laughs> literally. it's uh, literally... <laughs> Really behind the scenes, yeah. Very cool, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks for having me.
That's all I got for you this week, entrepreneurs. Thank you for listening in, and thank you to everybody that's been supporting this community over the years. Keep following us after the show on all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Mass Roots. We're out there. You can find us just about anywhere, even YouTube. So make sure to come back next week and join us for another show where we'll be discussing more topics, interviewing more guests. And this is getting bigger because of you. We'll see you next week. Oh, oh.